Good morning and welcome to Weekend Walkabout in our gardens and years virtually. This is GardenAZ.org that we're speaking to you from. I'm Janet McConovich. I'm Stephen Nicola. And uh, we're in our garden with one of our loose and free sessions this week. Um, as fall colors begin, I just the other night, fall colors oh. began to show up here. It's the end of the season, beginning, the beginning of the end, the end of, the of the season. season. Yeah, not the end of the season yet. Yeah. And uh, I actually found pictures of us looking the same way for one time. <laughs> and Sonia, too. Sonia is with us. Thank goodness. Uh, our daughter has been a wonderful gardener her whole life and also a, a great teacher. She is a mm -hmm. professor now at a university and very well versed in the technical end of doing the, uh, the chat and the uh, polls and the other things that we want to do or problems that you might have. So type it in the chat yeah. if you've got a question about gardening for us today or if you've got a, a comment about how this whole process of webinar works or if you just want to say hello, um, yeah. open up your chat window. We are more than ready to talk to people and hoping to talk to as many people as we can because that's how we've learned. We've been we doing thought, it. Yeah, 40 years. We thought we learned quite a bit um, gardening for people for about 10 years and then began writing and in the newspaper, I was writing a column that was based on questions. We had about 11,000 questions over 13 years of writing that column. And we answered pretty much every one of them, not all in the paper, because it just was fascinating. You'd find out things you never thought you'd hear about, like or just before we got started hearing about a hibiscus borer. Yeah. Okay, what borer gets into hibiscus? We're going to have to look that one up. Because um, that was obviously a borer, you know. That, if it's got a hole in it. It's got a hole in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we've written some books. I was teaching at the community college and it was better to have a book than to do handouts, uh, too many handouts, too thick handouts. So we, we've written some books and we put everything on our website now that we can. And today, where normally we have a note-taking guide for our, our webinars, today our topics are bouncing around all over the place. Um, we're going to reference earlier webinars and if that part interests you, then that's the place that you could go to on our audience materials page. Just find that, that webinar yes. and look up its um, its materials. So we'll do in our garden first, our first segment, we'll break this up a little bit, has to do with the changing temperatures. Um, it is changing. Yeah, we, we do this week in our garden, meaning that these are the things that are happening now. Um, and these are the things that are important right now. Someone told me one time that they uh, they did their garden writing. They would write a whole bunch of articles in the winter, and that way they'd be set up for the summer. And I I I can't do that. And Steve has a hard time uh, photographing things, which is you know the way we split up our work, because I I would write something for June. And in June, that's not what's happening. Actually, no, <laughs> so, that happened back two weeks earlier in May. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. that happens. Yeah. So we're we're writing now and we're talking now about what's going on now. And we're looking to you to help us know what's going on in your garden right now. Because there are still months of bloom to enjoy. There's still all the way into the end of no, uh, October and sometimes the beginning November. of November. Some for, go even into December. For the blooms. And, yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we met this week at the Water, Waterford Township Library. We do that each month. Normally, it's on the second Wednesday of each month. Next, on October, it's going to be in the third Wednesday of the month so that we don't miss it. Okay. We have a great time. Um, people talk. Um, things get, it just magically, things kind of happen across the whole scope of the campus there. We garden from across the whole front of the building and off into this, off to the side, there's a rain garden. Um, but uh, we walk together and we look at the whole garden and see what's going on, talk about what needs doing, and people just pitch in and do it. Uh, and this this <laughs> week, this month, it was um, a riot of color. Yeah, Not <laughs> quite planned to be a <clears throat> riot, but that is out there. Um, that was what we planned for that triangular, what, what we call our annual bed in, this, in the garden. But um, the Gamprina, yeah. Globe amaranth is what that is. Decided it liked it there. It it had self sown and people just enjoyed the heck out of it at the library. That was the, the most asked question of what, what is that plant over there? So we thought, well, we'll leave some of the seedlings. We only have left a few of the seedlings. You can see them there. There are those splay leaves that Steve's right here, pointing out here, there. Over there. It didn't there. seem like that many. <laughs> but Bam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we were doing a lot of taming. Uh, this is where they actually came from, where they actually belonged. 
And we left a few there also next to a peony and a, and, uh, and yes, they also came warbling up to the light and wrestling around at the edge of the bed asking to get out. So what we did is we cleared them back away from other plants. You can see the little um, bow between them and where they were right up against the light. And, and Paul has clipped them all the way and taken some space. plants out, made some space. But that's a globe amaranth. Uh, if you go to the library or you come and help, help us, um, there, it's very easy to just get that plant because you can take one of the seed heads home. Um, we also did a lot of, of tidying up, of just looking for things that didn't look good anymore um, and took out what was brown. As our saying goes, if it's brown, cut it down. If you look at the flocks in the background, that's a, a Carolina phlox. It's been clipped back. There's a bunch of green missing in the foreground, uh, for, in front of the Gallardia, the orange Gallardia. A bunch of green missing. A bunch of purslane that was growing in there and pretending to be something. Um, we deadheaded the canna because it's still going to keep blooming for quite a while. We deadheaded the Gallardia. We deadheaded the phlox. That's the Carolina phlox called opening act white. And it's not a it's not a huge change, but that bit of green going to brown and the stems that aren't blooming anymore in there, they do add bulk without contributing great, a great mm -hmm. deal. And, and again, this is a flux without any, hardly any mildew on it. And that's fairly crowded. And it's the third time we've deadheaded it. And it just keeps on going. I will say the one thing I'm starting to notice with it is that it is starting to flay open a little bit more. Probably will need to be divided soon. Yeah. And that's no problem. We divide yeah. things all the time and move them around. Um, so we've cut back the Rogersia there. People say, is it okay too? Rogersia it's okay too. Yeah. We take the leaves off when they don't look good anymore. We already cut back some other things. We deadheaded the uh, zinnias. That's the zinnia envy, which was had a lot of uh, fully done, fully long gone blooms on it. Um, we probably should have kept them and handed people some seed because that's a wonderful old cultivar. Some of it didn't get deadheaded all the way. If you look at the uh, area near the orange flowers, there you go. You can see that there were some that I almost said to someone because I walk around helping people do this and do that or do whatever. I almost said to someone um, who was, I think Marlis was doing the deadheading, Marlis, you could take some more off. And then I realized that she, like Sonia, noticed <laughs> doesn't want to or doesn't want to deprive the bees of even a single flower. And see, it is still flowering around the top of this, the cone. Is, these are the flowers. But it's been flowering for a long time already, and the others could It's weeks. Going. Yeah. Um, and, and who would know that it was going to get so big it would crowd everybody else out? It, it, uh, it was just two plants that were put in there between the coleus and the vibranum. Uh, we also grow vines. We have a, our little arbor set up there where we put our um, annual vines and we have a couple of perennial vines there all the time. The vines that are on there this year are, the orange one is getting all the attention. Oops. Go ahead and click. Oh. The orange one is Mexican flame vine. Someone last week in chat said, wow, I think it was Nancy, said, you say the name so readily. I'm like, well, pseudo this I don't even try. Yeah, pseudo -genoxis. Canopodioides, because it, something about it must look like, because canopody, canopody is the goosefoot family where things like lamb's quarters belong. And I think I'm looking at the leaves thinking maybe they're saying what the leaves look like it because that's what oides means. Um, so we don't say them readily either. We write them down several times and, and kind of chant them. I don't say ourselves. <laughs> He says some of them. The other vine, other annual vine there is rosy. It's a thunbergia, normally called black-eyed Susan vine. This one is rosy Susan vine see because it. it's the pinkest form. You see a lot of them that are yellow. Yeah. And try as we might, we could not get it to go all the way up. No, it wanted to go down and lay out a whole skirt behind it like it was a, a wedding. Uh, it like might it a have bride. a limit to its height. Huh. Some vines. <laughs> Have you seen Thunbergia? Yes, I'm them? just joking. Yeah, in California, this stuff, this is one of those bindweed type <laughs> weeds in California. I'm, there are there are a number of plants that I'm glad do not make it through the winter yes. in Michigan, and it's one of them. I, I like to grow it as an annual. Um, we also do a lot of changing and fixing all the time. We're constantly moving plants around all year. There's no really best time. 
our dill all grows at the end. We call that the dill end of the garden. And it's great. People are coming to the book return. It smells like dill. Um, the black swallowtail. Observant people see them. Yeah. And we are always handing a piece of dill to kids with a caterpillar on it, take it home and yeah. get them interested in it. But toward the end of the year now, um, where there's the dill has been going to seed, it doesn't look very attractive. And, uh, and it is not something that we want to have there. So we've taken most of the dill out. Plenty of seed has already dropped and we put prairie drop seed grass in at the edge so that we have something other than a wall of, of dill at the end. So we're always making these design decisions. The things we talk about, we say, well, let's move this one to there. That didn't do so well in the rain garden. Let's change things around. So we've added the prairie dock with the big leaves that you see there. Um, and if the, the rain garden is working wonderfully, it takes the extra water off of the walking area where people come in and out. This is, uh, this is after we're done with it. And we have a great combination of the hardy hibiscus with the purple leaves in the foreground, surrounded by the Philopendula vulgaris that looks like a Boston fern. It's a really good combination that's working very well in that garden. But it looked um, from the opposite angle. Steve took the afters when I was gone and I took the before, so we're not in the same place. But looking from behind, you can see all the brown here and that little bit of red. That's that area over here. Yeah, where we've cleared everything away, cut the milk with the swamp milkweed all the way down to the ground. We don't need the brown. We don't need more seed pods. We've got plenty out there already. And it just it, it cuts your work down later on in the year. It keeps, your, it keeps you um, getting the fewer of the ones that want to take over everything. And by doing this limited, it, it, it not cutting everything down saying, oh, this is the end of the year. You get to enjoy that garden. It, I know it's work, but you get to enjoy that. Look at how much nicer that garden looks, in my opinion, and how, after it was done. And how much more you can see and admire the things that are still blooming. That's our closed gentian, or also called bottle gentian blooming there. So, um, gentiana andrus, andrusii, there we go. Yeah. Um, it's a, just a, it's it's a lot of fun. If you'd like to come and garden with us anytime, we're always there. There's no commitment required, no dues. There's no rules. We just yeah. come and do things. Um, tempers are changing. That also means that there's the chance of frosty nights. My sister's 37th anniversary is this weekend, this uh, this week, and that yeah. means that this at this time, 37 years ago, there was a frost. This she week. know we know and we know because we. Um, we, we were, were doing what you. Sonia was doing last weekend. Sonia had had uh, been conned into, she didn't need to be conned, yeah. but into doing the floral arrangements for a, a, a kind of a family um, party, memorial party, and, which means cutting flowers, bringing them in, cutting greens and bringing them in, and uh, then spending the wee hours of the night or however long it takes to make X number of table arrangements. We did the flowers for my sister's wedding 37 years ago. And we grew the whole garden for her. We were doing all the flowers for it the church. It was done in Linda's garden. Yeah, for the yeah. church, for all the attendants, for the reception hall. Um, we had we had a truck full of flowers that the we were growing for. That you were and it was all in. planned out what days we would do what and then put it all in the motorhome and take it to Chicago and arrange everything. And the there's a frost coming. So we had to work all day long cutting flowers and into the night before the frost came to get everything cut. And, uh, and brought yeah. in, and that can happen any time now. Yeah. Um, so the question about when to bring in outside plants means watch the weather. Um, look at this succulent garden, what it's done. Isn't it gorgeous? Mm -hmm. We lost the aloe, I think. Yeah. Point out the aloe there in the background. The, the very this yeah, yeah that old aloe. I think that aloe just plain got lost someplace along the way. Um, but look at what the echeveria did. This one, yeah. Aren't they cool plants? Yeah. And you look at these things and think, ah, oh, oh, I can't give them up. I can't leave those outside. <laughs> I right. mean, there are a lot of our plants that could be inside plants. I've had people say, well, they're too big. I can't bring them. You can always just cut them back and bring them in and grow them if you think you can grow them inside. But do remember that they need time to acclimate. Um, this is not severe reflection on the leaves of the of leaves of this Dracaena. We showed you earlier this summer when we decided to with the Dracaena outside because we really didn't want see to see it anywhere. Yep. See what it did. Despite the fact that we had shade cloth over it for its first week out there, the leaves that were grown inside bleached right out, burned in the sun. 
Now, the leaves that have come since and have been grown in the light are, are fine, but they're also thicker and they are used to growing in greater light. And to bring them inside and put them into low light is going to be, is, is going to cause that plant to drop leaves and not perform very well. It will stress it just as much as it was maybe more so than it was being scorched. Yeah. So any, any, um, um, translation any any accommodation time that you can give them to where you're bringing them into lower light or um, putting them in a pot if you're gonna, uh, either you planted them in the garden in a pot or you're going to take them out and stick them into a pot do that and, and and give them less and less light because there's a lot less light inside mm -hmm. than there is outside there's a lot less light inside than there is even under shade of trees yes so it, this is a, a curiosity thing that has to do with who we're going to talk to about um uh, being our co-host in upcoming webinars. How do you feel about bringing plants indoors for the winter? If you have um, a minute here today, we have another poll and would like you to answer whether you always bring things in, whether you try different plants, whether you do it for the, the, for the fun, whether you're saving money. There's, there's no option that says the person I live with says we have to. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that would have to do with saving money <laughs> so how do people feel about bringing plants indoors we've got 38 percent saying that they always bring something in and 33 percent saying they hate to leave things outdoors but um, really can't give them what they need inside so that's uh, well over half of us close to close to three quarters really saying that um that we look at things and think about bringing them in and it's nice to know we don't have to. There are a lot of people who don't. There are a lot of people who say, I'm glad to have some time off in the winter, 22% of us. Thanks for those answers, Leo. Now, it's also uh, harvest time. A lot of people are pretty busy right now. <laughs> I know Diana's son, Patrick, is, is whisking around trying to get all the things frozen and canned and, and put up. We're growing this pumpkin. Uh, it's a volunteer pumpkin, and it was a pumpkin. Well, it was supposed to be, was a pumpkin last year. <laughs> we don't year. know what the was, thing is. We, we got it last year, seeds from a friend who said, here, this was a really great pumpkin. We grew it, and it wasn't a pumpkin. I said, it's a Hubbard squash pumpkin cross. Hey, we had huge squashes. Yeah, but... that, can, that can happen very easily in the squash family. If there's any other squash family plant um, growing someplace nearby, the bees are bringing in pollen from a different plant. It, it doesn't change the fruit of that plant that's growing right now mm -hmm. because those female flowers have the fruit already there and it's going to be what it's going to be. But the seed from that plant with that pollen from something else becomes a cross. And this one is a cross of a cross. Of a cross of who knows? But the neighbor thought it was a pumpkin because it was a pumpkin at one time. And, uh, and, and she told me, she said, oh, let it grow. I said, Cheryl, it's going to cover your lawn. And I don't know if you've even got lawn left under there. And you can see it's it's beginning to mildew now in some places, but it's been very nice up until now. She said, that's all right. It's fine. I, she I love it. it. I just I, love it. It's lush and it, I feel like I, I'm living in the tropics. Um, unfortunately, she doesn't like squash. Can you see them in there? This is what a uh, the grand the grandchild of a pumpkin of a once pumpkin is now <laughs> turned into are these crook necked kind of warty squashes. They're they're interesting. A couple of them have been smooth though. Too. Well, they start out smooth, then okay. they become warty. But it's cheerful and yellow early in the year, early in the day, each day as the flowers are open. She likes that. And there's probably about 50 of those squashes in there. So I've sent one to the art teacher at the elementary school to say, could you use 50 of these squashes? Because nobody's going to eat them over here. Anyway, it is time to harvest. I'm I'm walking around inside smelling my basil because, you know, if you don't get it when you think of it, then it gets cold it and gets it's not good. Um, yeah. Bring in some of your herbs, smell them, enjoy them, use them. Uh, I made marinara sauce that the yeah. kids, the grandkids wouldn't eat. I forget. They don't like chunky uh, sauce. Like, but well, those smooth. homegrown tomatoes, we got to use it. Um, all right. The next topic that has come up a lot in conversations and texts and emails we have with people today, this week, and, and in our own garden is that it's particularly weedy in a lot of places right now. And, uh, and it is a, um, a, a crime against gardeners that the drought delayed the summer seed, seeds, the seeds of summer weeds from sprouting because it was too dry. And then when, when, what, when rain did come, it was cool enough at night. The winter weed seeds are sprouting. So you're seeing things like this. That's crabgrass. I think you know crabgrass. And purslane, summer weeds. 
there they should by now have dropped seed into all of those crevices and coming up. But the little bits of green, we'll, we'll see them a little bit later. Little bits of green in the cracks, and there's lots of them. That's that's how big crabgrass gets. Um, it's a monstrous plant. That. And those seeds live 20 years once they drop. So don't let it get that far. And, and notice what the seeds do. They don't, they're not standing upright. They lean out past the plant. There's the seeds. So they won't get it. They are, going... they are conquerors. Yep. Um, but in the in the cracks, a lot of the little tiny things that are coming up in the cracks right now are winter cress. That's bitter cress, winter cress, spring cress, they're the mustard family plants that, mm -hmm. that need the cool to germinate and have that little, little rosette of leaves and then immediately flowers and seeds sweating all over the place. What a terrible thing for gardeners to come out of a drought and walk out to their garden and find double sets of weeds everywhere. Um, the neighbor got upset about weeds and so she got fabric and put it on the garden on top of the weeds. Um, on top of them. Yeah. You and, can see the bulges. Uh, and the, the bulges are where the uh, pokeweed is living up to its name and poking its way right through. Right through, right there. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that you, like we, tell people they don't always listen. In fact, I'd probably put it at 50% that fabric is not the way to go. Fabric it's, is is a, an abomination. To garden. And uh, a terrible amount of work required to remove it or weed on top of it later on. Uh, I talked to someone this week who um, echoed what Steve and I have said, that in redoing a bed at a house that she bought, she took out three layers of plastic and stones three. because people just kept putting more plastic and stones on top of where it didn't work or became weedy before. Tell people not to use fabric. It's gotta go. And we heard from... Uh, Michelle was asking this week, she said, do I have to get all of these size roots out when I'm digging out daylilies? I said, no, if they're, if they're good daylilies, if they're your nice hybrid daylilies, they need, they need that thick. They need to have this piece. Right. They need that piece. And even that piece, uh, a piece just like that would just get you leaves, but a piece plus the crown would get you flowers the next year. Um, the little roots, no, they're not going to go back. However, if it is the, the daylily that runs, what's called the ditch lily, or the one that's used for erosion control along highways, I'm, hold, I'm holding one up there. And if you look hard, you can see that it has a wider leaf than the daylilies that are um, here. first here. So I can recognize that it's there. And I'm loosening with a fork and removing the root that runs. And every piece of that root will come will back. Try. So if so, we don't worry about daylily roots for two reasons. If it's good daylilies, we take out all the daylilies we see. If a little bit comes back, we'll be able to pull it out without any problem. And so we know we can clear out the daylilies and, and go ahead and make it a new garden. If it is the, the wild daylilies, the ditch lilies, it doesn't matter how well we dig them out. We are not making that a new garden right away. It's going to no. sit there and lay fallow for a while. Um, we're also planting now. And this time of year, you can't help but say, I got to have more fall color out here. Yeah. Everybody does and extend the season. So we'll remind you of the uh, all the fall color that is to come all in sequence, all predictable. Some years more muted this year because it was droughty. Probably going to be more muted. We're suspecting muted, but, but last year we suspected better and it was kind of eh. Yeah, so can't predict it. Uh, check out the Smoky Mountain National, the Great Smoky Mountains National Parks map, where they they map out the uh, where the Color. colors are peaking. Um, and remember that there's shrubs like tiger eye sumac. The, and I love the very very late Virginia sweet spire. That shouldn't be going to color quite yet. Yeah, some the, of them I've seen have been, but it should be a later. The one on the right, we just saw at a nursery, and it's probably going in color already because it's stressed. Stress um, being in the pot. Yeah. But that's we could walk about 82 um, of a fabulous fall color. It's rather blown us away looking at it this week that we have 119 webinars recorded and available to anybody who's a subscriber. Um, we we um, that's a lot of information out there already. Hard not to repeat ourselves, but we think we've been doing that. We've been trying not to. <laughs> and and we need to let make sure that people know when they subscribe that they're not subscribing just to this year, but every subscriber has um, 
the ability to go into the library and see all of those things. We also have a lot of different um, free webinars out there right now. Yeah. And we'll do one. Well, I, today is one. Today is one, and then next uh, on our website, yeah. if you if you put fall color into the search field using our our, our website search field put in fall color, one of the articles that will come up is this one that shows you um, the, the, the different color ranges that you can get. And we've made a, <coughs> what we call the color guard. Um, we've listed the plants by their color is gold, orange, red, or maroon, and linked them <coughs> to uh, photographs and articles about those plants so that you could go through and look for the colors that you're, that you're missing. Okay, what questions have you got so far? Make sure there's yeah, um, we've got, uh, um, let's see, uh, the vine section from the start of In Our Garden. Uh, Barbara was curious if there was a third vine, and Luann is curious about where you got those vines. Did you start them from seeds? Um, there were there were actually four vines there. There were uh, there's a clematis. five vines there. Yeah. There are two clematis in the background, mostly finished blooming, but there were a couple of purple flowers left on the clematis viticella that's back there, and the clematis. Um, uh, General Sikorsky. And there's also a variegated um, honeysuckle. honeysuckle vine. Those are our perennial vines toward the back end. And the uh, Mexican flame vine and the Thunbergia. This year I bought those as started plants at uh, Bogey Lake Greenhouse in, in White Lake, Michigan. You see them here and there. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes at the farmer's market, they have unusual vines. But we've also started our vines at the library for seed, um, trumpet, uh, Cardinal creeper vine, we started from seed there, and lab lab vine, which is called something else too. What is lab lab vine called as well? Mm. Purple runner bean, purple, purple bean plot. Pl purple bean? Yeah. Uh, so we chose lab lab, mm -hmm. and we grow it because we have two black labs, and we have to grow the thing called the lab, chose lab lab. lab, lab you know? Okay. Um, and uh, Denise is curious, where is that location with dill? And I must have been looking away because I didn't remember seeing dill. Uh, our, uh, our dill at the library is by the book return. Uh, the end of the bed nearest the book return is our dill end. Um, uh, it's at the water uh, township library. DGC Northville says um, hyacinth bean. Hyacinth bean left? is the other name for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Purple yeah. hyacinth bean. Excellent. The purple one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Squeak says a question about working smarter, not harder. Is it more efficient to leave limes and Annabelle hydrangea heads on through the winter and just prune the shrubs to two feet in the spring? Just prune once? Personally, I think so, um, I, and, and we kind of like the, the seed heads on the hydrangeas in the winter. On the late ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so we, we leave them on and take them off afterwards, but some people uh, disagree with how they look and take them off. One of our clients used to paint them. She would paint the heads of the hydrangeas as they started to get dry, and she would paint them orange for Halloween. And she'd paint them um, uh, silver for the holiday season. Yeah. And every year, somebody in the neighborhood would ask me while I was out there working, what is that bush with the flowers on it in, you know, in the wintertime? Um, yeah. it like a and uh, Squeak says she has over 30 hydrangeas to do. Um, so well, that's a lot of deadheading. Maybe, maybe smarter rather than harder. Maybe that is take half of them now and half of them in the spring. I, I don't know. I Yeah. yeah. If, I don't know the calculus you're, there. If you're cutting just to cut the head, flower heads off, I would say wait until spring unless they really uh, uh, bother you. If you want to cut your work or spread your work out more, go ahead and cut them down in the fall. You're not going to kill them cutting them no. down in the fall. Not if they're a vigorous hydrangea. They're just they're going to come back all right. You're also younger in the fall than you will be in the spring. <laughs> and in better shape. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Uh, Dave says our Korean spice viburnum is in full bloom for a second time. Is this unusual? Um, it, it it is unusual, but not not that not terribly unusual. Uh, there are a number of plants that um, bloom in the cool weather that after a long a, a good long growing season, if they get a certain amount of cool weather, will get tricked into thinking that it was winter and open buds up. They are actually buds that are probably going to open next spring, so you're actually sacrificing some of the bloom. In some cases, it can indicate that the plants are a little low on potassium and didn't stock up enough of it in the bud and the bud got cooled earlier, but azaleas, forsythias, lilacs, um, viburnums, we'll, we'll do that in a little bit. In fact, some plants, there's a cherry tree that's sold as a twice blooming cherry tree because it's a reliable, yeah. it's a clone that reliably blooms twice. The uh, blue meringue, terrible name, 
the blue meringue lilac does have it. Well, the lilac we have out front has had a bloom on it. And <laughs> just about every month, every year. It, all year so far since May. Just um, a bloom here. But it might, right now, I think it has five. You know, and, we, and we know it has had those blooms because we see the hummingbird go over there. You go, what's the hummingbird going to? It's yeah. found one flower that's open out there. Um, yeah. I am I am reminded of a question that was there last week, and um, we we didn't deal with it as a whole group, but it was about what to use to divide one ground cover from another. And I think Mary was asking that. And Mary, I've got set aside a question here that that uh, that might be yours about a big bed that you want to have a bunch of different ground covers in in a display garden. Um, the thing that we often use to divide lawn from garden ground cover from another ground cover is the is the carpet runner that went into chat last week that we insert into the ground vertically to keep this plant from growing its roots into this plant. But some ground covers don't spread that way they spread across the top of the ground and then you need something above ground a little a little a little wicket fence a little um something yeah <clears throat> uh, and some plants spread by seed and those are harder to keep out and need to have like a no no plant zone so depending on the ground cover you might need a couple of different things to keep things separated yeah. we've got michelle has a follow-up on the annabelle she says she cut her and cuts her annabelles down to a couple of inches should she not be doing this Oh, oh, no problem. Annabelle's, Annabelle's okay. bloom on, on new wood without any problem it's at all. new wood, you, and you I, can cut it down lower. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I like Annabelle's better on fresh, um, strong stems. They they start getting too twiggy and, and uh, cl cluttered when they are left on their own. Yeah, and Bob, I saw your hand was up for a second that I see your uh, uh, question in the chat. Do you want to ask it on mic? You're welcome to if you'd like. Sure, thanks. Hi, everybody. Hey, Bob. Uh, is there a window still open for treating magnolias for sucking insects with neem oil? I know it's a little bit off topic, but you gave me some advice on that earlier. Um, it, it might be a little bit late. Um, as long as the warm weather continues during the days, um, you, you could expect some activity, but the scales are getting older now. And the idea was to treat the magnolia scale when the young crawlers are still uh, still thin skinned and, and don't have much defense against the oil. So it's worth a try. Thank you. Sure. Yep. I love it. Barbara's painting her, uh, her evergreens that turned brown. It's painting <laughs> yeah. them, yeah. painting the roses. And, uh, and Judith has a veggie question, um, maybe inspired by your uh, pumpkin gourd mutation vine. Um, she says, I got four zucchinis from three plants in full sun this summer. They got uh, they got full sun and adequate water. Should I try a new technique or different seeds? Um, Judith, I also had a very poor zucchini summer, despite normally being bumper crop. Um, so that it might might not just have been you, might have been pollination issues. Uh, Jet and Steve, do you have any other ideas? Yeah, we there? saw one of our neighbors had um, a problem with her her zucchinis and cucumbers were not doing much of anything. And I, I think a lot of it had to do with it was it was very cool and rainy early in the year, and they they weren't forming female flowers. They were getting big enough to flower, but not big enough to actually support the female flowers, which come after the after the plant begins to flower. So I think we just had a, a slow flowering season, and then it, we could have had a low pollinator season later in the year. And you know. Don't. And it could be variety too. My cucumbers did phenomenally, um, and it might have might have just been that they were they were a um, more cold cold tolerant. Uh, that bug tree, so that is an American lady uh, um, caterpillar uh, on a pussy's toes. No, that one is on an Artemisia on one of the border islands. Uh, um, one of the other things that they can live on is um, uh, sand Artemisia. Of course, on dunes and barrier islands, and that's what that that one is. All right, we got one more from Barbara and then I think we'll call it and move on for now. Um, Barbara says, I planted sweet woodruff and I'm happy with its spread. However, it's crowding out some coral bells. Any advice for managing sweet woodruff? Um, sweet woodruff is creeping almost entirely underground. It will seed itself somewhat, but so a barrier on, in ground will keep it on and you can, you can uh, give the coral bells kind of room with a wide barrier around them. But I, I mostly, let sweet woodruff go until it gets to the point where I'm upset with it. And then I, I edge it, I slice it and lift it up and take it out. Take it out. Yep. But those are the only two things I've ever done with it. Um, let's see. Okay, so we'll keep going. So that we'll call that the end of changing temperatures portion of in our garden today. 
thanks for tuning in with us. And we hope that you'll not only tune in with us again, but um, subscribe to our webinars so that we can do more of these. We have 119 of them today that are on a, in a library for any subscriber to use, not just this year. Ooh, can I break in actually yeah. for this? Yeah, yeah, there was a question we didn't get to from Kathy about, I need to reduce the height of arborvitae by about one third. Never pruned, read a lot about how to do it but would love any advice, thanks. Kathy, the best thing I could say is consider subscribing and get an entire library full of pruning, including one of our uh, first year webinars from August uh, 2020, uh, exclusively on pruning evergreen shrubs and trees. Even just last week, we did uh, quite a section on, on pruning. Um, this is the place to be for pruning. Uh, so yeah. that's my, my best recommendation there. And your timing is excellent because a little later on, we're going to invite you to come just send us an email. We can take another six people to go with us to prune an arborvitae to keep it small. Um, we're doing that this coming week and that will be in the webinar a little bit later. But yeah, please um, help us out. So um, we will move on. We split this up into pieces so that the recording is not so long for people.